This is Doing Life with Your Adult Children. We have Jeff and Brenda Jones uh, that are going to join us this morning to present this topic. We're looking forward to hearing from them. Uh, Jeff and Brenda have been in ministry work for many, many years. Now they do some coaching and some counseling work. And I am personally really excited to hear a little bit about their story, their adult children, how they've gone to uh, from knowing and learning more and more about how to parent adult children and move through some of those different ways that we can be better parents. Uh, like I said, I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, so I'm always looking for as much information as possible. So I think what I'd like to do uh, is go ahead and turn it over to Jeff and Brenda. What I'll do first, though, is just remind everyone to stay on mute um, as we're going. If you have questions or, or comments, go ahead and put those in the chat box. We will read those out. Um, so that the people watching the recording later can know what we were talking about. But we really want to encourage you to use that chat box. I know they're going to have questions at various points in the presentation. We really do want to get feedback from you and hear from you. Um, so with that, uh, we just ask, Father, that you bless this time that we are here together. We thank you for putting these words, your words, on our brother and sister, Jeff and Brenda. And we just ask that this be a sweet time of learning and getting to know your heart better in Jesus name we pray amen so right, Jeff and Brenda what do we need to know about doing life with your adult children well we'll Thank never you. cover it in 45 minutes to an hour but we're going to jump in um, we're in the process of learning this work so we join you not as experts but as very vulnerable learners in it um, just a little bit about Jeff and I, and Marcus has already told you a little bit about what we do. We've been here on the Grace Neville campus about five and a half years as volunteers in the re-engage ministry, and I'm a Bible teacher in Trail, and Jeff welcomes folks at the coffee bar, um, and we've just loved our time here, and certainly the Lord has used our time on this campus and this community to bring lots of healing and restoration in our hearts and lives, so we're very thankful for our Grace Neville community. We do have two adult children, and they are launched, so to speak. We have a 29-year-old son who is in Florida, um, and we have a granddaughter, Carson Taylor, who is absolutely precious. Our daughter, Hensley, is married, and she is living in Gwinnett County, and she's an ER nurse, has been very involved in running their COVID-19 unit. So that's a little bit about our adult children. You'll hear more about them as we continue on. Um, in, in the journey today of parenting adult children. So our work is not solely based on the book by Jim Burns, but um, this book definitely is a great uh, rich resource for you. If you would like to invest in it, I think it's $2.99 on Kindle through Amazon. Um, it's worth the investment to buy the book and to go through it. But we do know this, that um, we want to be very candid with you in the conversation and just invite you into um, the challenge as well as the blessing of doing life with adult children and knowing that perhaps during this pandemic you have found your house full of adultish emerging adult children um, both in high school and in college and maybe even young adults that have moved home for a season and with it um, the challenge is also the opportunity to bless them to call out on your children adult children what you see God doing in their lives and we don't want to miss that opportunity but we know that as we parent adult children, our relationship with our children does have to change and our parenting style has to change. And sometimes that is a lot of fun and sometimes it's a little bit painful. So um, we're going to jump, a little, jump into our learning. Yes, so we have to ask ourselves, what is our goal? What is your goal or your desired outcome? What are you hoping to see in the lives of your adult children? What is it that you would like to see happen in the lives of your children as they become adults? So we'd love for you to take an opportunity to put some things in the chat box and share a little bit of those with us, and uh, we'll come back to them and look at them. But what are your goals? What do you hope to see will, that will happen in the lives of your children? In the work of counseling, we look at a term, and the term was comes from Bowen Family System. It's called differentiation. Differentiation is helping your child develop their own set of values, when you know your own values, when you're able to find your own voice, when you're able to speak up for yourself a little bit, when you can share what you're feeling, when your child can become open and they can own and accept responsibility for themselves, they're aware, they're self-aware, they are then able to 
to find their own voice as an individual. And you see them grow and mature. That's differentiation. And, and we're working toward that. They become their own individual. And so a lot of you are popping up and, and, uh, and it's exciting to think about what we would like to see. And as we think about this, how does your child develop their own individual voice and who they are? We have to ask ourselves as parents, what kind of parent do I want to be to help my child? What kind of parent do I need to be if I'm going to see my child be able to reach their goals? If I'm going to see them become the individuals and the, and the people that I would like to see them become uniquely who they are. The story that... Hold on a second. I, Can we see their chats first before you start? I love sure. that story, but... Let's look at the chats. Can we yeah, look? yeah, great. So that, that question we have there, what are you hoping to see with your adult children? We have some praying that they would love God and follow him well. Um, we have, I, I hope my children have a relationship with God and follow Jesus well. Another, another great response here. I want them to know who they are, know what they are called to do and live in community going after the kingdom. That's a word right there. Um, mm -hmm. Love God, enjoy relationships, spouses and kids. So there's a lot of hope there, guys, for, for the future. That's beautiful. For yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and, and it's good to see. So we do have these heartfelt goals and dreams for our children. So the parable in Luke uh, chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 11, I call it the parable of the prodigal father. And I do that for two reasons. The first reason is the central figure of the story is not the lost son and it's not the elder brother. It is the father. He's the central figure of the story. And why would I call him prodigal? Well, if you look at the definition of prodigal, it means giving lavishly. So we see this father as one who gives lavishly to his son and to both of his sons, really. So we're familiar with this story. Who wants to understand that this story is, is a description of how God fathers you and I? And we have to take that and, and understand it. So in our familiarity, we understand that the younger son, he rebels somewhat against the father. He leaves home. He takes his resources. He squanders his resources. He becomes irresponsible in the way he's living his life until he comes to a point that he realizes that he's really made a mistake. But in it, we see that he's completely lost a sense of his identity. He doesn't even recognize who he is anymore, and he returns home. And in verse 24, you, you see this, this verse in Luke 15, 24, as he's come home, and he said, make me like a servant. Just treat me like a servant. This beautiful verse. The father says, for this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. And, and you see that sonship can never be lost. Sonship can never be lost. That's a beautiful point of that story. But then you begin to see, you see the other brother in the story, the elder brother, and he chose to stay home. And that's, that's a key point. He chose to stay home and to work. He chose to stay where he was. And in that, he somehow came to the belief he was entitled to more than he was receiving. And he, his entitlement led to a resentment, not just a resentment of this younger brother who had gone out and, and was irresponsible, but even of the father himself, he was resentful toward the father that he could not come in and celebrate. So he passes judgment and becomes judgmental of both the father and the son. And the father has to go out to this son and understand there's a note in this parable that, that I want you to see. The father has to go out of the house to both the lost son and to the elder brother. He has to go out to them. That's his relationship. And he, see, he looks at him, and in verse 31, he says, he says to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. What a beautiful picture. So in the work of Andre Nowen, there's a book called The, the Return of the Prodigal Son. And in it, he says, and in this work, this statement, 
At one time, we were all the prodigal. We were the lost son. Too often, we sit in judgment like the elder brother. We, like the elder brother, pass judgment on others. But here's the beauty. The goal of our lives is to reflect the heart of the Father. The goal of our lives in parenting, if you take it to this place, is how do we parent and reflect the parenting that God and the way he parents us? How do we do that? We, we see that God pursues relationship with us, but he allows and gives us responsibility for our lives. He gives us freedom of choice so that he pursues relationship and allows responsibility. So, wow. Thanks, Jeff, for that word. Um, I love that story. So when we look at how we want to frame our learning today, Jeff and I chose, I know Dave Rhodes is so proud of us, we chose an X, Y axis. Um, I love quadrants. Um, I think it's just simple and plain to see. And so as Jeff said that we have to understand that God is always seeking high relationship with us, but he is always giving us a choice to have responsibility for our actions and live through the consequences of the responsibility of our actions, but he always maintains high relationship with us. He's always invitational. And so that's why we chose to frame um, our thinking today around these two concepts. As you, as you can see, high relationship, low relationship, low responsibility, high responsibility. And we want to look at these quadrants, but before we do, I want to just frame this for yourself to let you help you understand as adult learners, all of us at any moment in our lives, we are unconsciously incompetent. In other words, we don't know what we don't know. We're doing the best we can where we are, but there's, there's new learning out there for all of us. So today as we go through this, maybe there's things that you just had no idea and you're going to feel the tension. And the tension comes between the challenge, which is truth, but the invitation, which is grace, to embrace the truth and bring change in your life. And, and that's what God is all about. So as you hear things today, if something pops out and you go, oh yeah, I do that, and you can cheer and go, yes, I'm doing that, that's great. But then you might hear something else, like I know I always do, boom, wow, that's me, I don't like that. Be okay with the tension live in the tension because that's where the change is going to, to come from. So uh, that's the grid and we're going to jump into the quadrants. And let me say this, that Jeff and I reside in all four and you're probably see yourself in all four quadrants. You probably will see yourself in all four just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you will also probably find that there's one that is very descriptive of your go-to. Uh, and, and as Brenda said so eloquently, we live in the tension between truth and grace, but in the tension between truth and grace, and John's talked about it in his sermons in the past, that's a place where God creates change within us, that that's how he helps us to become more like him and to develop his character in us. So the first quadrant is controller. It's high relationship and low responsibility. We emphasize the relationship and we minimize responsibility. What happens in control is we begin to own responsibility that's really not ours to own. And so that can, we, we begin to want to take and fix the lives of our children or our children. We want to rescue them from the pain, from the consequences of what's going on in their lives or how we see the mistakes. So we want to come in and make sure that their lives run and go smoothly and make everything go well in their lives according to what are our dreams, our hopes. And sometimes those are our dreams and our hopes. Uh, there's a story that we, we think about of our son. We worked so hard to get him into college, all right? Looking back, the truth is he was just not college material. I don't mean he that was not. He's, he's, a, he's a very yeah. intelligent. He picks up on yeah. things quickly. He has he has an ability and an understanding. Uh, he's a fast learner. However, to sit in a classroom just not so we worked really hard to get him into college, including being at orientation weekend and having to call him to wake him up to get him to the places that he needed to be we should have seen all the red flags. See, we were trying to control his life in some way. 
we were owning responsibility that is not ours to own. We were over-functioning in his life. And what happens is when we begin to over-function, we take responsibility for their lives or for fixing their life. We create a couple of things that happen. Number one is we are taking responsibility away from them, which can lead to them losing confidence in themselves. They don't have self-confidence because we come in and we're saying by our actions, oh, you can't handle this, so let us handle it for you. Let us take care of it for you. But the second thing that happens in, in their lives when they do that, and it's an unintentional outcome, is they become resentful toward us. They resent what we're doing because we are robbing and, and taking from them responsibility that we need to allow them to the freedom to have that that's love love gives freedom that's that's a part of what we see in relationship with god and then it allows them to have the consequences of their lives they've made choices they've made decisions there are consequences that naturally go with decisions that they're making so allow the consequences to become the teacher allow pain to teach and it becomes a good teacher. That's, that's the tension between grace and truth. And we allow them to experience that in their own lives. Uh, allow, let me say this, that if, if you're dealing with a child who is entering into the world of addiction in, in some way, if we go in and try to rescue them, we are allowing them to stay in the very place that is self-destructive and destroying their lives. So by stepping back and allowing responsibility and consequences to come, we, we're, we're actually giving God freedom to move in the lives of our children and not getting in the way of God. And I often found I got in God's way and didn't allow him to complete the work he wanted to complete in the life of my children when I went into control mode. Uh, that, that, was my, that was my first one. That's control. The second one is cut off. Uh, cut off is low relationship and low responsibility. We just check out. We are checked out of the lives of our children. We disconnect. We distance ourselves from them. What happens is it leaves our child in a world of chaos. It creates chaos in our family. It creates chaos in our family relationships. Then it produces abandonment. Our child can become, can feel like they've been abandoned or that they've been rejected and we've turned our back. And I think that's an unintentional outcome, but there's no relationship. There's, there's low responsibility. So we've backed away from their lives and we've left them out there totally on their own. And again, that's an unhealthy place to leave our children. This this is a difficult one because in it, we still need boundaries. Boundaries are values. They're our values. They teach people how to treat us and we can, we can set up those boundaries, but we don't want those boundaries to become so, so heavy and so thick that it limits our connection and relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think too, before we move on, um, I also can move into controlling and the more I, especially with Christopher, our oldest, who has walked a road of addiction, who is living in sobriety and doing well now, but um, the more I went into the control mode of trying to fix it and rescue, and it came from a place of, of love for him, but I did not realize what it was creating in him at the time. Um, the more I did the control part, the more checked out Jeff could get. He could, it could play against, don't you think? Mm -hmm. It sort of played against, um, we played against each other instead of being unified. And then that allowed Christopher to keep spiraling in his addiction. And um, also when we started setting boundaries with him, as we can with our children, if we don't set them in love, like Jeff said, I know some of the boundaries we set with him, we did, did not always pursue the high relationship to let him know that we still loved him and cared about him enough 
So I think it did create some abandonment there. So, and we can always have more conversation with you. If you're in that situation, that's an extreme. Um, we would love to be able to um, sit with you and walk with you through that. So let's look at the third quadrant, which is, um, which is can be me. This is what I deal with a lot. And it's, we call it the critical parent, parenting role. And basically, um, and here's what happens is, um, critical sounds negative, but what happens is we look at our children, we look at them as they're making decisions and taking responsibility for their lives. I think about our second child, our daughter, who um, is very self-aware, um, very much responsible. As far as college goes, we really did not even know where all she was applying. She just took the responsibility. She's the type A personality. And, but what happens is sometimes uh, for me, this is what happened with me, I felt um, I did not realize my role needed to change with Hensley. And so I felt like I was losing a little bit of control or a little bit of relationship or um, influence I had in her life. And that created this tension within me that I did not like what was coming out because then I would say, be very quick to give her advice. And when you give an adult advice, an adult child, any adult, that's not asked for or invited, it's seen as criticism. And so that's what happens with our kids. It comes off um, as criticism. We can, when we're critical, we may emphasize the rules or way we see it, or we may base it on performance. Oh, you've got to be, um, I was really hoping for you to get that A in that class. I know that you're able to do that. All of those types of statements just create that low relationship because as our children are emerging into adulthood, they will see it as criticism and they will push back on relationship, okay? It pushes them toward responsibility, but the signal that I give if I'm trying to tell my children a better way when they don't solicit my advice, the message I'm really sending them is, I don't believe that you have the God-given capability to hear from him and to make those decisions for yourself. And so um, it creates that angst in relationship. And something else I don't think I ever really thought about, but Jim Burns brings out in his book is, if we give, give our kids advice and if they take our advice and things don't turn out, then they can come to resent us because it didn't turn out the way we said. And, um, and also just trusting, he really emphasizes in the book that experience is the best teacher, that we want to, to keep our kids from having to walk through some of the things that we did, but experience and pain is a really great teacher and, and trusting that. Um, so, and something else with critical, I think as well as controller, um, especially when our kids were still in our home, and I don't think I really own this thought, and it's a really tough thought to think about, but a lot of times we deal with comparison, how our family looks against other families in the church or in the community or for me, Jeff was a minister, I'm a teacher, we're supposed to look this way. And so sometimes we move into the control or critical mode because we want to control how we look. It's almost a, uh, we preserve the image that we're giving. And that's never from a, a great place. We think about how God parents us, his unconditional love for us and, and giving us the choice and free will. So that's the critical. So we looked at controller, checked out, cut off and critical. And now we want to move into the quadrant where we can have high relationship with our kids and encourage them to take high responsibility. And this is the quadrant that I just believe is where what I've learned about our Heavenly Father and His relationship with us is He is always present. He is always there. He is the best listener. And um, He is engaged with us. He's never distant. Um, it doesn't matter what we do. He is always there. And through the Holy Spirit, and through using other people in our lives, he presents questions for us to engage our thought process in, well, what are the choices I need to make? So that's what our Heavenly Father does with us, and that is what we're called to do um, with our adult children. And that just rolls like velvet off my tongue. And I want you to know it is so hard to live it out. But there's an acronym in the book that Jim Burns um, gives, which is accepting, it's uh, awe, accepting, warm, and encouraging. And isn't it awe that strikes us about our Heavenly Father that 
uh, the longer I live, the more I embrace the truth of who he is, that he is all accepting, that God is warm toward us, even though we are sinners still. And he is always the encourager through the Holy Spirit and through other people. So we want to be able to move to that coaching quadrant, not only with our adult children, but in different levels with our kids as they are in our homes, giving them choices and helping them think through their decision-making processes. Um, so we want to move to that with our adult kids, especially if, so I don't know, I didn't read all your comments. I know for Jeff and I, not only do we want our adult children to love God and have a relationship with him, so therefore Jeff and I want to continue to have a relationship so we can continue to share with him our journey with with Jesus and with hearing from him. But we also want to have family relationships and do family vacations together every year. We want to gather during the holidays. We want our children to want to be with each other even when we're not present. Those are goals that we have. Um, and those are our hard goals to reach unless we embrace the coaching um, quadrant and really do approach our kids with an unconditional love and the heart of the father. So now we know the quadrant. Let's talk Very a little true. bit about our journey a mm. little bit with that. Uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about, Jeff shared a story about Christopher. Um, I remember, I want to share with you a story about my daughter Hensley and, and the critical part. So it was a Hensley was finishing college and coming home for a short season to live with us before getting an apartment and she got engaged and I was getting ready to retire from a full-time career. So I was going through a lot of change myself. I just remember a conversation I was having with her about the young men she was dating and I knew felt like would soon be um, her husband. And I remember her pushback when I started giving her some advice. And I remember her response to me, Hensley is someone I have a great relationship with. I've always had a really good relationship. And I remember her walking out that door the day of that day and sitting down. And I was face to face with the fact that there's this ugly that comes up in me. There's this tension that rises up. I had this fear that I was going to somehow lose a relationship with her. It was not going to be the same. And I had to come face to face with that. And in that moment, I remember Jeff coming home and um, I was processing that with him going, oh my gosh. And we were in re-engage. Jeff and I helped facilitate that. And, and one of our um, concepts in re-engage is you draw a circle around yourself in your marriage and you work on everyone in your circle. And <laughs> that's only you, right? And so I just thought with Hensley, I can't, control her. I can't fix her. I can't make decisions for her, but I can deal with me. And so that was the beginning of my journey, um, getting some counseling uh, for me personally to talk about what is that that's coming up? Where does it come from? How can I move forward? It was learning to deal with self-care, exercise. Uh, Jeff had been in some teaching with, I think, Men's Frat, and we invested in some uh, personal training to strengthen our core and you think what does that have to do with parenting it has everything I think self-care is something that for a long time I thought that was selfish it's not if we are not healthy ourselves um, then we cannot be healthy for anyone else so that was the beginning of a journey for me coming face to face with some things in myself that I didn't like and some of those things I was seeing in my adult children and realized oh my gosh my actions actually um, gave them that I passed that on to them uh, and so that was the beginning of our, our journey. And then, of course, being involved in re-engage and strengthening our marriage and then investing in the marriages of other people. Every time we go through that process, it just reminds us of the tools and strategies that are so important to keep your marriage unified as you parent your children at whatever stage. So in your chat box, what we're going to do is give you just a minute to uh, respond to a question. Uh, and the question would be this, is where, what quadrant do you most see yourself in? Like, where do you most see yourself? Now, a friend of mine, my friend Jack, he said to me after the, uh, the first time we did this live, he says, well, if I'm not sure, I'm going to go ask my children because they've already figured it out. 
If you really want to know, go ask your children. Ask your children, kind of give them the concepts of this and tell them, ask them to be honest with you and say, where, where do you see me as your parent right now? And uh, then when they tell you, if it's not something you want to hear, just say thank you and walk away and think about that. But, but look and take an honest reflection. Where, where do you see yourself? What quadrant do you see yourself in? And as you respond to that, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit. Brenda was telling you that I can cut off and I can bury my head in the sand and try to, to avoid things because if you know me, I just, I'm not high on conflict. That's not something I enjoy. So I would just avoid. But then when I couldn't avoid anymore, I would often jump up to the controller and try to come in and fix it. But what happens is, is in our relationship, that has an effect in our marriage. In our marriage, that puts Brenda in a place where she feels like that she needs to jump in and she needs to get busy with things. And, and I don't want to speak for her, jump in her circle, so I'm staying out. But I know that that's what happens when I do certain things. And so it affects our marriage. So let's look at and see what are what are some of the comments that are coming up. I saw one that popped up and said, "Yikes, critical." Uh, there were some others that popped in. Where have you seen yourself? Yeah, we got a couple of answers in here. We got critical controller, uh, critical coach. Uh, we did get the yikes one uh, with each child. I have a set of different quadrants, but it's awesome to name those. Uh, I'll go ahead and fess up to mine. I, I live in controller, but I like to vacation in critical. I, I bounce back and forth between. Uh, those two. If, if, if you're not going to listen to what I have to say, that's fine. I'm going to lower the relationship and lower my responsibility and put it all on you. So um, I'm getting some very helpful language here this morning. Yes. I see that it depends on, depends on the situation and the child. Absolutely. We bounce around. The beauty of a coach is asking questions. So there are times that uh, in my old life, I think I stumbled into getting it right on occasion. And uh, so our son gives me a call one day and he's in a, he's kind of in a difficult situation financially. He's in a difficult situation. His job, the place he was working had promised him a raise and they had drugged their feet on that raise. And so they had gone past the 90 day mark and they were pushing out but not only were they not giving him a raise, they were then telling him they were going to cut back on hours, that he could work four, hour, four days a week, maybe three, and he's just doing the math in his budget, and, and the numbers don't add up at all. So he's, I could have said, well, we could send you some money. Uh, see, now I'm jumping into fixing it mode, right? I'm not putting confidence or trust in him to be able to resolve it if I do that. Instead, I step back and say, well, hey, bud, what options do you have? Like, what do you see as your options? I, I'm not down there. I, I don't live down there, but what do you see? And he walked through those. Well, what happened is he calls me back a day or so later, and he says, I made this telephone call. And in this call, he connected with the owner of a company who was looking to hire he moved from a job that was doing a, a the similar service to a, a same job. Basically, they increased his pay like by four or five dollars an hour, and they work five days a week. He solved it for himself, and he developed such self confidence in that by being able to do that. And so, just by asking questions, being curious allowing them to think through, they get to create in their lives the life they want to create. And it's, it's a beautiful thing when you see that happen and to allow them to coach them into that. And it so improved our relationship. It so improved his self-confidence and it allowed him to be responsible to take responsibility for his life and himself. So in that, though, I'm like Brenda, I had to work. I had to work on myself to become the parent that I needed to become in order to allow and help my children reach their goals and, and to see the dreams for their life, their dreams for their lives become a reality. And so uh, in doing this fraternity, we were looking at five capitals. We were coaching in physical. So we did go in and, and, and take care. I took care of myself physically. Uh, got myself in, in better health, do self-care. And then emotionally, 
what I want to say is, is, is I'm going to, we're going to ask you a question in just a minute, but emotionally I went into counseling. I went into seeking my own personal counseling and taking care of my own emotional needs. But in that we, we slipped into and, and did some 12 step work. And, and 12 step work is, is both really develops emotional health, but it also develops the other, the other, the third circle, spiritual health, because it is spiritual. We pursued, I pursued my relationship with God through doing those things. And I realized that what was <clears throat> limiting my spiritual growth was really my emotional unhealth. And as I became more emotionally healthy, I began to grow spiritually. But in growing in those three areas, our relationship began to grow. We became stronger as a husband and wife and as a team, and we became stronger as parents because your relationship as, as a husband and a wife is foundational to your family. It's not parenting. It's your relationship as a husband and a wife. And as you have a better relationship, you're going to naturally move toward becoming healthier parents and supporting the lives of your children. And so those were the things that, that I had to do in my life. And I would say the question is, which of those should you pursue in your life? Right. So we put a quote up here that I think um, sort of frames this work um, that Jeff was talking about and I was sharing with you that we've done is, and I want to read it just because I think there's power in the spoken word. I know there is. Um, being willing to put yourself in the back seat of your children's lives and to grieve the loss of the front seat is what gives you the, chain, the, the chance to change the relationship and make it wonderfully different. But that won't happen if you aren't emotionally, physically, and spiritually healthy yourself. And that's the words of Jim Burns in the, in the book that we're referencing. So um, I know that grief, um, we, we normally think of grief as a negative, but grief, if you go through the process, actually gives birth to something new. And we all have to shift as our children become individuals, which we all want them to love God, to pursue him, to have a relationship with him. But guess what? They may go through a season where they walk away from their faith. And they're met because their faith has to become theirs. It can't be our faith. It has to become their faith. And so if we allow ourselves the space to grieve that we're not driving in the front seat anymore, we're in the back seat coaching. If we grieve what we thought our children's lives were going to look like, um, even though we see the potential they have, if they choose something different or they're going through a different phase, if we grieve that, then we do the work on ourselves, then we can parent in a way that changes the trajectory of our relationship, of our lives, and it addresses what the blessing is, the legacy that we can leave to our children and to their children. So, um, and I know my, it was my counselor that pointed out to me, Brenda, you're in grief. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am. So that may be where you are today, I don't know, or maybe even thinking, oh my goodness. That's what's going on with me. So think about yourself. What are, what are the steps? Is it an emotional health step you need to take? Um, is it <laughs> spiritual? Is it physical? We didn't include financial. That definitely could be a part of it. We are holistic. Um, you know, maybe it is reading the book. Maybe it's, I'm going to make the point with the counselor. I know I've been needing to do that. Maybe it's community. Perhaps it's re-engage, working on your marriage relationship. Um, it could be, there's a couple great resources. Uh, we love the book, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter, I never can say his last name. Cazaro. Cazaro, phenomenal book. Um, Jeff and I are leading a small group in that right now and probably will launch another one at some point. Um, another book, Adult Children of Immature Parents is one that Jeff's read. I have not had the courage to read it yet, but I'm going to. Um, there, there are different types of steps you can take. So um, I'm going to pray. And well, I, th I think what I would say is, is we can look at this, and I don't, I, I wouldn't want you to be like uh, overwhelmed. So if you look at it physically, emotionally, spiritually, 
ask yourself which just one what's one step is it do i need to work on my physical health do i need to work on my emotional health are there steps spiritually that that i can take identify that one step that that is yours the the way i believe that people most know that the one the way i knew it was thinking about going to a counselor created the greatest tension with me. <laughs> All right. That's when I knew that's the step I need to take. I'm in a pretty good place physically. I've maintained good spiritual disciplines and health, working on our marriage. But boy, I need to work on myself emotionally. And I want, I want to remind you of this, that, that God parents us, that God is a redeemer, a restorer and a reconciler of relationships. And he wants to do that in your life, especially if there's estrangement in your relationship with one of your children. He wants to redeem their lives. He wants to restore them. And his dreams for their life far exceed anything you or I can imagine for the lives of our children. So good word. hold on to that uh, as you move forward. And we'd love to hear from you. And uh, if there's, there's a way we can, serve you in some way in the, in the future. Tell me, pray, Thanks. and then we'll listen to the chat, see if they put some things in the chat box and steps you might be thinking about. Um, Lord Jesus, we just invite you into this time. It's really hard, Lord, sometimes to look at where we are. And we also know that that's the birthplace of what you want to do in our hearts. So I pray for every listener, either present today or a listener in the future, that through the Holy Spirit, Lord, you woo us to the step you would like for us to take. Give us clarity, Lord. Give us courage and Lord, help us to have community to hold us accountable in the journey that we're taking. We love you in Jesus name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So if we could look at Marcus, can we look at the chat box? A minute yeah, we can. You guys steps? got a lot of feedback. I'm going to scroll back up a little bit. We, we got a couple more uh, on the which grid uh, quadrant they fall in. We had a couple people talk about um, when it comes to school stuff, they were a controller, but they also hang out a lot in critical. We got checked out coach, um, checked out as my children get older, and I love to visit often to coach. Um, also some interesting comments about uh, coach becomes more natural as newlyweds move out of the house and into physically distance geographically. Right. But maybe that's something you can speak into in a second. Um, there's another thought down here. I just joined a group uh, of adoptive moms. We get together once a month to talk. This is helping me emotionally in this season. So I guess um, as people were putting questions into the chat box, one question I would have for you guys, you, you mentioned that your children, some of them moved to geographically different, different states. How do you navigate um, that growing relationship? As you said, you're working within your own circle, but how do you keep the lines of communication open as children are dealing with their own circles, their own stuff, or are they moved away from you physically and you don't have that direct, con that direct contact yeah. as much? That's a good question. Do you want me to jump in? Then you jump in? Or sure. So um, with our son, we um, just made it intention that before, well, before COVID-19, mm -hmm. our intention was we were there about every eight weeks, 10 weeks. And of course, we always are invitational in that. We put it out there. We would love to come see you. Um, I remember how it felt when my parents and Jeff's parents would come into our home. So a lot of the times we will stay in a hotel that spend all day with them, but we will go back to our own space um, when we're there and give them space um, for their family. We are always invitational in a um, summer vacation at the beach every summer, gathering together that we right now um, uh, financially invest in and not requiring them to give back at, at this point. Uh, we always listen to their schedules, which is really hard, and we try to always bend and accommodate their schedule at the holiday. So we, we very rarely celebrate on Christmas, but we make it special when they can all come together and we can be together as a family and engaging in activity. So, um, and I would say we don't wait, I don't bother them every day texting or expect them to call me every day. But if I haven't heard in a couple days, I'm not going to fall victim. I'm going to create what I want. So I'm going to reach out and say, hey, hope you're doing well, praying for you. You know, sometimes we'll send them encouragement like that. Yes, trying to keep that open, but always rem remembering uh, when, they, when they call, uh, to give them that freedom that we're not going to try to dive into something in their lives. 
uh, to be curious, to listen, to ask questions. Uh, because if I find myself going into control or fix or criticizing something about their lives, uh, they are now adults. They, they live outside of our home. They're not going to be passing through our space. So we have to create that relational space by practicing good steps. And those times when we over, when I overstep my boundary uh, and into their circle, I have to apologize and step back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that's, that's becoming invitational for them to call and feel like we're going to listen and, and, and be there for them. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. We, we have a, a great question here in the chat box, a more observation. A person is uh, grieving the change in relationship with a 19-year-old daughter who abruptly left home a year ago. Um, so yeah, that, that, that may be a good place to kind of dive in and get some insight from you guys. That college age years, 18 and 22, um, as they're you know not quite teenagers anymore, young adults, but not quite seeing everything there is to see, what would you speak into how, how we can grieve? I know you mentioned earlier about grieving being a process and that being a, a healthy process. What would you speak into that? Grief is, is painful. It's something that we do feel like we've lost. Here's, here's a, a, a reality. When our children tell us that they're studying and getting ready for a test, they could be standing outside of a bar somewhere uh, going back in to hang out with their friends. True. So there are things we don't know. COVID-19 has really changed that because it's changed their lives and it's pushed, put them back into a lot of your homes because their college dorm rooms closed down, right? And now they're back in that space. And how do we give them freedom in, in, in the context of that space, knowing that they, they've had freedom? Uh, it was something we wrestled with a little bit. Uh, things really, really do change. And so when they go off to college, the best thing that we have done, hopefully, is to prepare them to be able to take responsibility and make decisions in their lives. Mm -hmm. So in this, if your children are in high school still, if we can encourage them to develop their own values, to be able to speak up for themselves, to be able to make good decisions and understand that there's responsibility that goes with decision making, uh, that may be the best way to help them. But there are times that an, an 18, 19 year old may reflect the life of the younger son in this story. And they may go off and they may look at us and they may say, I've got this, I can handle this. And in the back of our minds, we're knowing uh, we're going to have to be a lot like the father of this story and be patient and be present and wait on them to come to that place where they're willing to come back to us, knowing that there's a restoration in brokenness right. and healing. And I would say, and I think Jim Burns talks about the book and Jeff and I had to wrestle with this with our own, um, own children, especially our son, if you have an adult child, adultish child, a college age student, and they're, they're rebelling, uh, they've had this freedom. It is okay as a parent to say, when you're living in our home, we're providing a roof over your head. These are the moral boundaries here. These are the things that we value in our home. We value sleep. So therefore we're not going to come in at three and four in the morning. You know, we realize you had that freedom, but since you're back home, this is, you know, negotiate the time, the curfew time. Um, talk about what you are absolutely not going to allow. I'm not going to allow you this, this, this. And I, I can't decide for you what that is, but you know what those are. But you're up front. You put it out in front of your children. You say to them, now this is, this is how it is, and this is not critical. These are our values. We want you to have your own values. But the, this is what we value. So you are welcome here as long as you're being productive, you know, whatever if they're in class or whatever they're doing, they're working. But if you cannot live by this, you have the right to move out and find your own space because this is important for us. So those are hard conversations to have, but you can do it in love and, but you can be firm in your boundaries and it's okay. Cause I know there's a lot of parents probably, I know we, we've talked to them that and we dealt with this, 
there was all this going on and we didn't want it to go on with our son, but we would try to set a boundary and he would come against it. It was just, it's, it's sticky. It's hard. That's where as parents working together as a team mm -hmm. is important. Being unified. Yes. But, but boundaries are your values and that you teach people how to treat you. So, so you mentioned those hard conversations. We had a question a little farther up. Uh, have you, did you have an open conversation with your children about how your relationship is or has changed or do you just allow it to happen? So I, I think even for me, as you work through the quadrants and you're working in your own circle, is that something you're um, communicating verbally or how, how did you guys navigate as you move from quadrant to quadrant? Is that just an open conversation you had with uh, your children? How did that work? Yeah, for me, um, I've been really open with my children um, that I'm working on me. This is what I'm doing in counseling. This is where I am. And um, I listened to a sermon. I forgot the title of it by Andy Stanley years ago. It was basically our relationships are like a pie with our children. And we have a slice of the pie that we have to own. And they have to own their part. And so, yes, I know when we were working an active 12 step, when Christopher was in recovery, I remember a letter I wrote to him and I had to own something that was horrific, a decision I had made that I should never have made as a parent. And I had to own that. So yes, I've been very vulnerable and open. This is what I'm working on. This is what, how I'm trying to approach it. Because there is, if you think about in the garden, Adam and Eve were given the, um, the responsibility to name the animals. So there is a power in naming what we are doing, what we are seeing, even in naming what we see in them and calling it out. Um, and so that's been a part of what I've done. And I know you've done that work too, Jeff. Learning to stay in your circle is a big, uh, when this happens, this is how I feel. Uh, I had to go and apologize uh, in particular to our son that I made some mistakes that I did not allow him to, to make his own decisions and tried to step into places that were not mine and that I was going to back away from that. But that also meant that he would have responsibility uh, that I had probably taken away from him because I had, had limited. So I had to, to own the things that, that I did in their lives with them uh, as a way of, of stepping back into my circle. And here's what that does. Um, I don't want to tell the story right now, but here's what happens. When we take the action step of obedience, which is basically confessing to our children, I've learned this and this was wrong. It doesn't matter whether they say to you, I forgive you. Christopher never responded to the letter I wrote him in recovery. But someday, face to face, I'll share with you the restorative story of what God created and how he has given me opportunity of an opportunity after that to parent Christopher well, to parent Hensley well. And it has restored and brought me full circle, even to the point that Jeff and I can sit here in front of you today and be vulnerable with you and tell you this is the journey we've taken and invite you into it. That's just who our loving father is. Um, so don't, don't be afraid of that. It's a beautiful thing. That's beautiful. Well, I think we just wanted to really quickly, if you could just mention the name of the book. I know you mentioned the author a couple of times, uh, the book that we, you kind of referenced today, and then any other resources you think might be helpful to people listening today or watching on the recording later. We'd love to just get those again at the end so people can have those and rewind back to this point. Okay. Sure. So you want those now? Yeah, if you can just go ahead and say them out loud, and we'll make sure we get those on the resource page as well. Okay, so of course the book that um, we referenced um, by Jim Burns, which is on the PowerPoint, and then Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. Scazzaro. Mm -hmm. um, Adult Children of Immature Parents. I don't know the author. I don't remember the okay, author. Uh, it, it's a real reflective, and, and, and you'll see in your own life, uh, some ways that maybe your parents passed along some things, which is a family systems idea that it, it, it gets handed down and that they were really doing the best they could. And as parents to know that we really did the best we could. And as parents for you to know in the lives of your children, you've really, you did the best you could with, with where you were and what you were given. 
And so these resources are just to help us grow so that we can, we can serve uh, our adult children better yeah. uh, as life moves forward. And we're not in the same place that we were uh, 10 years ago in our own lives. We're not. Or even uh, last year. Right. Um, and then, of course, the re-engage community is for everyone. It's not just for marriages that are unhealthy. It's for any marriage who wants to move forward and to actually be in, be in community with other people that are very vulnerable with you in the journey. I cannot recommend it enough. It's where God has brought so much healing and enrichment in our lives, um, as well as just getting into a community with anyone that you do life with, that you can have these candid conversations. Anything else? And there's a list of grace counselors somewhere, Marcus. I don't know if you know where that is. There's that a is, yeah. We have it on the resource tab on the main website. So we do have a list of counselors, Christian counselors, grace vetted counselors that we can put people in touch with. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning. That was wonderful. I mean, you can get your flowers here in the chat box. Everyone's so good. Thank you, Brenda and Jeff. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, just great tools to put in people's toolbox. So um, we want to thank you again for your time. And again, this recording will be available on the website so you can share it uh, far and wide going forward. So thank you guys for your time this morning. Have a good yeah. day. Thank Blessings. you, guys. Blessings.